Kia ora, year 12 and year 13 and year 11. Um, here are the next two questions from this week's scholarship calc session. So this is video three. So these two questions focus on domain and range and inverses of functions. And then um, we've got a little log question, kind of simultaneous equations, which is not too bad at all. If you're looking at the domain and range stuff and you're going, oh, I haven't seen that before, what you might want to do is go on to either Khan Academy has some really good stuff on this, or I'm pretty sure the old edition of the Delta textbook does. So ask me or send me an email and I can point you to some more questions. I'm going to go quite slowly through these ideas, but the biggest piece of advice I've got for this first question is always, always try and draw a graph, especially in situations like this where the graph is not that hard. So let's have a look um, carefully at question two. We're given two functions, f of x and g of x, and we have to first of all find the inverse of function f and state its domain and then we have to find in the next question we have to find fg now fg looks hard but it's not all that means is it's f of g of x and when we're working with inverses and functions we're always thinking about what values can we put in so the x values that we can put in are the domain and what comes out is the range so to find the inverse of f of x um, here's the big idea if we've got f of x um, with a domain, those values that can be put into the function will become the values that come out of the inverse. So graphically, what is an inverse? So I've got a nice graph coming up, but let's do a bad graph first. Um, if this is f of x for whatever function, then the inverse function is the reflection of that in the x equals y line. And if you remember that, you hopefully won't have a total brain freeze on how to find an inverse. Because it's a reflection in the x equals y line, basically what we do to find an inverse is we swap the x and y values over. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is the graph of this one here. So this is e to the power of something plus 3. So it's got a vertical shift up, and here's the graph here. Right, so this is f of x is equal to e to the 2x plus 3. Now, to find the inverse, we're going to switch over the x and y. So first we write it as y equals e to the 2x plus 3, and now we switch, and we get put a line through there so we know we're on the inverse. So x is equal to e to the 2y plus 3. All I have to do now is to make y the subject of the formula. So x minus 3 is equal to e to the 2y, take logs to base e of both sides, log of x minus 3 is equal to 2y, and now divide through by, half, by 2. So we get a half, natural log of x minus 3 is equal to y. So there you go. That's the first part done. Now, the last thing we were asked to do with that was to figure out what, state its domain. Okay, let's look at the graph. So the domain of f so let's work with f of x first. The domain was um, x can be any number, but the range was not that. You can see that there's an asymptote here at 3, and you can see that even from looking at this function over here. right? y will never be below 3, so the range is y is greater than 3. So when I do my inverse, the domain for f inverse of x will be x is greater than 3. Now you can see that again in the functional form. Here's my inverse here. I can't stick anything into my natural log function that's going to make this thing here that I'm frantically underlining um, negative. So you can see it from the function or you can see it from thinking about the graph. So let's have a look now at what the graph of that inverse function looks like. And there we are. That's both of them on the one graph. So this is f of x and here's f inverse of x. Right, on to the next question, which is looking at a function of a function. I actually find these easier, um, as long as, again, you're careful with what can go into the function. And um, for those of you who had me in Year 9, which is only two of you so far, um, you'll remember we talked a little bit about function machines. So here, we're starting with an x value, and we're that should really be a round circle, and we're sticking that x value into the black box, which is f of x, and then we're sticking, sticking, sticking it into another machine, 
which does whatever the G thing is. So in this case, it's the other way around. We're finding FG, right? So FG is equal to F of G of X. Right, now sometimes, especially if you're doing the Math 199 course, you're probably going to see this notation, right? So I'm not going to talk about that today because I don't want this video to get too long. But if you've just got the FG notation, it's just as simple as doing this. So, what's g of x? Well, g of x is the log of x minus 1. So we're going to take the log of x minus 1 and put it into my f rule, which is e to the 2 times whatever. Right, so this we can now call y. Let's simplify this. Well, one thing you'll see happen a lot this year is, and you'll see it in level 3 when we do differential equations as well, that we can rewrite this. We can't do much with it as it is, but if we use our power rule to go backwards, we can write that as the natural log of x minus 1 squared plus 3. And now we can um, take, what am I doing now? Well, these things are inverses. So e to the natural log of something is just equal to x minus 1 squared plus 3. But we have to be really careful with this. If I said at this stage, just draw me that graph, and you were back doing level 1, you'd draw me, uh, what would we do? Well, we'd go to 1, we'd find the vertex, and we'd draw that parabola there, only yours would look better. So that's 1, and that's 3. But that is not right for this question, because if we go back, um, we have to look at the domain of the functions. So we were, asked to, we were asked to state the range of the function, but we have to also think about the domain. So what can I put in to the g function? Well, I have to have x greater than 1. So that means that when I come through and find f of g, I can't put in anything that's going to make this negative. Okay, so the domain here is x greater than 1. It has to be strictly greater because the natural log of 0 is not defined. So the domain is x greater than 1, and I can see very easily from that that what's the range going to be. Well, this is always going to be strictly positive, no matter what x we put in, plus 3. So the range is going to be y is greater than 3. Or, more beautifully, we could write it like this. So fg greater than 3, and fg is a real number. Now I've got the graph of this one. Um, on the next slide. This is also in GeoGebra. So if you're new to Scholarship Calc this year, or Cambridge, or Level 3, it's well worth downloading GeoGebra, or just bookmarking it. Um, you don't need a login, but if you set yourself up with one, you can save all your crazy maths creations. So if you go there, you can do these graphs super easily. And you can even put in f of g of x once you've set them up. So this function here, this is f of x. This one is g of x, right, and you can see that that's the natural log of x minus 1, because the natural log curve, ln of x, will go through that point there. So this has been shifted one unit in that direction. Now this thing here is f of g of x, and you can see that GeoGebra has automatically figured out that it's got a restriction on the domain and on the range. Okay, so I think for most of you, that's probably a little bit outside of your comfort zone. If you've done Cambridge, you will have done inverses in AS. So go back and look at those notes if you've still got them. Make sure you've got this down pat. It comes up a bit in scholarship. Right, here's the next one. Um, and this is a log question that's accessible to everyone. So let's look at these two equations. So log to base 2 of x minus 5y plus 4 is equal to 0, and log to base 2 of x plus 1, take away 1, is equal to 2 log to base 2 of y. So the nice thing here is that I've got log to base 2 here, and here, and here. Now this is not a log, but I'm going to look at a way that I can make it a log. So this is my way of doing this problem. Let's start though with Simplifying this, because I can I can eliminate the log in here really easily as soon as I spot that I've got a zero over here. So rewriting that log using my loopy thing, right, so my definition of a log, we get this 2 to the power of 0 
is x minus 5y plus 4, so that's 1, giving me negative 3 is equal to x minus 5y. So we're already happy because we're going to be able to substitute out x for y or y for x. Now let's take a look at the second one to see what we can do here. Well, the way I worked is I thought about this and I thought, well, I want to make that number be log to base 2 of something. So log to base 2 of x plus 1 minus, well, 1 is just the log to base 2 of 2. And that's equal to 2 log to base 2 of y. Now we can use our log rules to put some things back together. So we've got log to base 2 of x plus 1 over 2 is equal to log to base 2 of y squared. Since the logs have the same base, this thing here has to equal this thing here. That leaves me with x plus 1 is equal to 2y squared, skipping a tiny step. Um, so x um, is equal to 2y squared minus 1. Um, from above, from up here, we can rewrite x as 5y take away 3 is equal to 2y squared minus 1. So we're down to a quadratic. 2y squared minus 5y, um, adding that to both sides, we get plus 2 is equal to 0. So I'm going to make you do that by grouping. Don't reach for your calculators, please. This something times something is equal to this number times this number. So 4, and then something plus something has to add to give me negative 5. So what I'm doing here is I'm breaking up this middle term. So what two numbers multiply to 4 and add to negative 5? Well, it's going to be negative 1 plus negative 4. Negative 1 times negative 4. Some of you, hopefully lots of you, will do this just by looking. But you never know when you're going to need quadratic grouping. Right, so factorising that term gives me y into 2y minus 1, minus 2 into 2y minus 1 equals 0. Factorising that gives me y minus 2 times 2y minus 1 is equal to 0. So y equals 2, or y equals a half. Now we're going to substitute to get x equals what? Well, x is 5y minus 3, so that gives me x equals 7. Here, I get x is equal to 5 over 2 minus 3, which is negative a half. So we've got two solutions. We've got 7, 2, or negative a half, 1 half. Now, as it turns out, both of those are solutions, but we really should check. And the reason we need to be paranoid is because we're working with the log function. So go right back to the start and look at the original equations. Well, we had log to base 2 of x minus 5y plus 4 is equal to 0. So we need to check that, really, that x minus 5y plus 4 is positive. So let's do it first for x equals 7. What do I get? Uh, what have so 7, take away 10, plus 4, and that's greater than 1. Um, for x equals negative a half, we get negative a half plus 5 over 2. Am I right? Is that right? I think that's right. No. Minus 5 over 2, because I'm substituting y, plus 4, which is also just greater than 0. So that's looking good, and I should just have a look at the other equation. So looking in here, we need to have x plus 1 positive as well. Um, so we'll be fine with both of those solutions, and y needs to be positive for here. So always worth doing. Sometimes in scholarship, the last few marks do depend on things like um, chucking out solutions that aren't valid. For those of you doing level 3, the other place you must be really paranoid about those is when you've got um, square root equations, um, I don't know, like this. Things like that. When you get your two solutions at the end, just go back and always check that um, the equation is satisfied. Right, thanks for watching. I'll be back with the um, harder questions later on, and they are going to be looking at the binomial theorem.